Welcome to Dear Co, episode number four. Hmm. Dear Co, I have a problem. I've been dating this female for about five years now, and she just has a problem with cleaning up. I knew it when I first met her, but I was just thinking as the years go past, she'd come around. But now it's just getting really nerve-wracking. I talked to her several times about it, laughed and joked about it, thinking hopefully she'll get the idea. But no, nothing ever happened. It's gotten to the point now where I can't take it. I had a serious talk with her and it started out good for a week. Then she was back to normal. What do you think I should do or how do you think I should handle this situation? This is kind of silly to me because I feel like you've been with her for five years and you know what kind of person she is. You knew what kind of person that she was when you met her and you knew that she was junky. Get a maid. Get somebody to come in and clean up. Make that compromise. This person is not going to be clean. She's just not a clean person. Five years down the line, you can't ask me, dear Cole, what can I do? You know what you need to do. I don't want a, a dirty house either, but certainly five years later, I would know what I was getting and I know I would know what I had and I would act accordingly. Dear Cole, I have a new friend that I've recently become really close with and as our friendship has progressed, I found out that he had a really, really intense drug addiction that I didn't know anything about and that he was able to like kind of mask whenever we were together. But he just recently had an intervention with his family, and I can see him going down this slippery slope once again. How much is too much for me to step in and try to help? I don't really know how much to help him or how much help I can be to him. He seems kind of depressed, but I don't know how to save him. What can I do? Well, you can't save him. You know, people that are, are drug addicts have to save themselves. They have to hit their own rock bottom. So the best that you can do is be there. Just sort of give him like a, hey, you know what? You know, I'm here. I love you. I'm your friend. Whatever you need from me, you know, it's here. And I and I have you. And, and, and just know that you can come to me for whatever it is that you need. I mean, obviously, except for drugs, you know, if he's an addict. But just let him know that he has your full support. But in terms of trying to like step in and, you know, trying to help and trying to be this interventionist or whatever and play that role, you can't do that. And you can't can't save everybody. Again, people have to save themselves. So once you realize that, and once he realizes that he needs to get up from his rock bottom, then you all can, you know, move towards a new friend or whatever, a new person, you know, and he'll become a better person from that. So, you know, stick to it. Hopefully, you know, you are able to maintain this friendship and hopefully he's able to be, you know, to, to be sober for life. I, I wish you all the best. Dear Cole, seriously though, I know this kid that is recently divorced, marriage lasted a couple years, and the ex-wife chose to keep his last name. He started dating again, and during a recent argument with his ex about keeping his last name, the new girlfriend decides to jump in and ask why she insists on keeping his last name. Knowing all involved parties, I know that she's keeping his last name because of some abuse issues with her family, yada, yada, yada. He asked me what I thought about the whole messy situation, and I said I thought the new girlfriend of a month has no right to say shit to the ex-wife about her last name. Do you agree? Well, I do agree. I think the new girlfriend needs to just shut the fuck up and let the two, you know, hash out whatever they have to do. I don't really think that um, the girl necessarily has to give up her last name. If that name represents something to her that she identifies with, I don't see any reason for him to act as if she's, you know, committing some sort of crime against him or that, you know, she should get rid of her name and, you know, drop it and go back to her maiden name. That's her name. It, it, she changed her name legally, and that's who she wants to be. Dear Cole, long time viewer, first time writer here. We've only had three episodes, so that's a lie. What's the protocol on non-black people speaking Ebonics? I often find myself subconsciously using phrases such as not nah, mean and y'all a lot when talking to black people, and I feel it sometimes comes off as trying hard and assimilative. As a fellow of Asiatic descent, is this kind of vernacular acceptable to use towards those of the black variety, or should I just start talking with a Chinese accent to everyone just to be safe? Please advise. Code switching is a very interesting thing. And code switching, which is, you know, sort of adopting a, a certain kind of accent or dialect when you're in different groups. For instance, the way that I talk to you all is, is sort of like a very general, proper way. If I'm talking to some of my people, it's a more relaxed, you know, it's a less formal sort of speech. If I'm at work, totally like swoon, you know what I'm saying, suited up, you wouldn't even know it was my voice. Like, it's a totally different person. With black people, we code switch a lot. Like, I have about eight different accents, you know, that are in my, you know, in my, my library. But... I don't want to hear somebody adopt a black sense because they're talking to me. Most black people don't want to hear that. So you're best off just being yourself, talking how you normally talk, and don't come out the box, you know, trying to give me like the yamines and, you know, like what's up, shoddy, and what's happening, and don't, don't give me none of that shit. Dear Co, I'm getting ready to make a major move in nine months. I have money saved, about five grand and counting. 
I've applied to schools and I'm waiting to hear back. My current job search in the area I'm looking for so far hasn't been that successful, though I'm qualified or even overqualified for the positions I've applied for. I am intent on moving to the area because there are a large amount of companies in the industry I want to be in and also know quite a few people there. So my question is, have you or others you know had luck moving without having a job or have all of your major moves been with those types of situations in place? This environment that we're in right now is very, very different. So even though you have five grand saved up, I don't know where you're moving. If you have five grand saved up and you're moving to New York, that doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a job by the time, you know, let's say six months is up or what have you. It doesn't guarantee that, you know, you'll be able to get a place. It doesn't guarantee anything right now. A lot of people are just not working and that's just, you know, nationwide. So you have to look at things a little bit differently. What you may want to do is use someone's address where it is that you're interested in moving, you know, with one of those friends that, you know, or family, whatever it is that has um, the address there. But in terms of picking up and moving somewhere right now, just on a whim, if you don't have it 100% together, I would not recommend it at all. And I'm somebody that is all about, you know, just sort of doing things, you know, just spontaneously. But this is not a situation, not right now, where I would be spontaneous. So I, I certainly advise against it. Next question. Dear Cole, my mother isn't perfect. She's made a bunch of mistakes that I've come to grips with and has since made up for many of them. But those scars are still a little sensitive when touched. For instance, lately she's been defending and enabling my 18-year-old nephew and berating his mom, my sis, for essentially not babying him and is pissing me off. Whenever we talk about what's going on with my nephew and my sis, I can't help but to make comparisons to how my mother was when I was 15, 16, and 17. She did many of these bad things that she's accusing my sister of doing, and then some. And when I bring it to her attention, she gets angry, accuses me of lying, calls me bitter, and usually hangs up the phone. But I can't let it go if she insists on pretending it never happened, like she was Mrs. Cleaver and I'm crazy. I never get the chance to tell her, though, how I feel, though, because she's always hangs up the phone on me where the combo starts heating up. So how do we resolve this? First of all, your mother's not an idiot. She's not a dummy. Your mother has, you know, your mother was a, was young too once, and she's made a lot of mistakes. I don't think that it is beneficial or, or helpful or fruitful for you to tell your mother, like, Mom, I remember back in the day when we used to smoke weed. What is that? You know, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? It doesn't help anybody. If your sister's out there messing up, she needs to be called out on it. If your mother's calling her out on the stuff that she's doing, then she's right, and you know that. Why would you tell your mother, like, oh, mom, you used to do this too? If it's wrong, it's wrong, right? I mean, you know, why, why do we need to, to go ahead and, and go back to, like, 79 when mom was out there, you know, with her legs hiked up? You know, who knows? You know, so what? You know, I mean, mom did that. You know, now she's a born-again Christian, whatever. Let's deal with what's in front of us right now and, you know, and stop being so, so ornery. Your mother and your sister, that's something that they need to work out on their own. You don't need to jump in there and get hung up on and involve yourself in this. This is not really your battle. This is two grown women with children that are battling about something that has nothing to do with you. So you need to fall back and be quiet. Dear Co, this saga has been going on over the course of nearly 15 years and thus has many layers. But for the sake of your format, I'll keep it as short as I can. I have a family member that I love very much that is getting the shit played out of him. The core of the matter is that his longtime girlfriend is out there hoeing. I know for a fact that she has contracted an STD. Not from him a few years ago, but due to the nature of my work and hell, the law, I can't reveal this to him. She's so sloppy with it now that the streets ain't even got to watch her. Her spot has been blown several times, totally by accident, recently in the last year. But the last occasion got so messy that it's gotten to the point that some family members have seized contact with him and won't invite him to events because he's likely to bring her around. I'm tired of staying out of it. She has ruined his life in quite a few ways, and I can't hold my tongue anymore. How should I approach the situation? He knows what his longtime girlfriend is on. It's not like he doesn't know. Maybe he's cool with that. He could be He could be cool with her messing with different dudes, you know, as long as she comes home. I would have a talk with him and just let him know that, like, look, man, I'm just, I'm really just worried about you. You know, you've been disconnected from the family, like, all over this chick. Like, what's going on with you, dude? Like, you know, we love you. We support you. But, like, a lot of this shit that we see around town, it's just not good. If that doesn't get him to come back over... Y'all can't save him. Some people do choose relationships over family. And good people will choose relationships over family. Some guys like what they like, you know, and sometimes what they like is, is toxic. You need to send me a postcard. That's the end of Dear Co. Episode 4. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. I enjoyed it. Cheers to y'all. I love you.